It's good to be with you this morning during our, uh, our equipping hour, our Sunday school hour here. Let me uh, open our time in prayer and then we will dive in. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for another day of life and an opportunity again to gather as your church on this Lord's Day to worship uh, the risen Christ, to fellowship with each other, um, to hear your word, to sing your praises. Uh, pray that this morning, that this day would be honoring to you, Lord Jesus, uh, that our hearts would be thankful worshipers, that we would uh, spur one another on to love and good deeds as we interact with each other this morning. And I pray that we would be humble under your word, that we would grow in our love for Christ and our love for each other and uh, just our, our appreciation, our thankfulness for your gospel that has saved us, that has brought us from death to life. So I pray that this morning as I open uh, Luke the Gospel of Luke, that we would be uh, encouraged, convicted, strengthened uh, in your truth. Pray these things, Jesus, in your name, for your glory. Amen. All right, well, good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Kyle Frazee. I have the privilege to uh, lead the, the students here at Grace Bible Church. And uh, it's, it's hard when you're doing, I'm just doing a kind of a one-off uh, equipping hour here. Uh, it's hard to pick, uh, what do I do with just uh, with one week? So I just picked a passage that uh, a passage that's been an encouragement to me that I uh, go back to often uh, just, to, uh, just to remind myself of what is true about life and death and eternity. And, and I titled this, uh, this lesson, uh, Following Christ in a Consumeristic Culture. Uh, in a consumeristic culture, what I mean by that is a, a culture that is, you could say, is self-indulgent. Uh, that goes after a pursuit of convenience, of comfort, of ease. Uh, just think about all of the, the temptations uh, in front of us in this life, all the temptations that come after us. Uh, obviously, in the, the world we're in, all of the, the godless uh, ideologies, the attack on gender, the attack on biblical manhood and womanhood, the attack on, obviously, on God's truth. But I think one of the, the subtle dangers of the world we're in uh, is just a, a consumerism, just a, a subtle a threat of us going down this this river uh, that our, our culture pursues of, of comfort and ease and just a, a safe, easy, prosperous life. And we can, uh, if we're not uh, grounded to the Word of God, we can can go down this path. We can just get, get really comfortable uh, in a really comfortable place, in a really a nice uh, city uh, with a lot of conveniences. I was, I remember just here in, uh, I've heard this several times from the, the missionaries in Papua New Guinea, from the Cairns, Zach, talking about life in P&G, and just the difference of life in a third world country, and one of the differences is just the, the lack of conveniences, you know, that we have here, that it, in America, he said, it, it feels like that you're actually in control, because you can, you know, one-click purchase on Amazon, same-day delivery, uh, you can go to Costco and you can buy any, anything that you want, everything that you want, times 10. And he said in, in Papua New Guinea, you actually aren't able to do that. Everything that you plan uh, fails. Uh, trips get rescheduled. Planes don't arrive on time. And, and you actually realize that you aren't in control. But here we have this illusion that we are in control, that we actually uh, can control our own destinies because of all these conveniences, all these comforts. Uh, really a society built on how do we make things more convenient. And obviously there's nothing wrong on the surface with you know, having conveniences. Having a, a washer and dryer is a, a great technological advancement. But again, if we're not careful, we can get sucked into this mentality of just living uh, for comfort, living for pleasure, living for entertainment, uh, getting sucked into a, a consumeristic, uh, self-indulgent lifestyle. And we could even you know, show up at church on Sunday show up at a small group on Tuesday, go through the, the motions of the Christian life as we s subtly shift from a, a purpose of glorifying the Lord to a, to a purpose all of a sudden that becomes, how do, I, how do I indulge myself? How do I serve me in my comfort? And we're going to look at a passage this morning, like I said, just a, a passage that, that's an encouragement to me, that's convicting, that's just helpful for us to come back to regularly, just to, to really to shock us awake to hear from the Lord Jesus, uh, this is what you must be living for. And here is a, a danger, you could say, of living for self, 
uh, danger of a, a self-indulgent lifestyle. And you can think about just different passages, uh, different words of Jesus that, that, that shock us, that actually are, are trying to grip us to not go after uh, worldly pursuits. Think about uh, Luke 12. Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Or Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Uh, you have these different passages, these warnings, where Jesus is saying, here is the a value of earthly things, and here is the value of heavenly things. Or how about Mark 8, 36? Jesus says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul. I love that passage because you have really, I think of it like a, a scale. On both sides of the scale, you have on one side the, all of the things of the world. What will it profit if you gain the whole world? And on this side of the scale is your soul, your eternity. And he obviously, Jesus is saying, there is, it's not even an equation. Obviously, the weight of the one, or the weight of your eternal soul, so much more, worth so much more than the things of this world. We're going to look at a passage this morning that hopefully has the same effect to shock us, but more than just a statement from Jesus, it's actually a story, a parable, a picture from Jesus. I don't know if, if you all have ever taken those, uh, I think about different uh, job applications where you have to fill out uh, kind of a personality assessment, and it'll ask you all these questions, and one of them is like, you know, what type of learner are you? Do you like to learn, you know, with pictures? Do you want to see the, the big picture first? And I think about this, uh, this parable. I think about just some of the parables of Jesus for those that like to learn in pictures. I want to see a, a picture of it. I, I want to hear not just the statement of it, but I want to see, I want to see the picture. I want, I, want to, I want to see how it plays out. And here Jesus actually gives us a, a picture. He's going to show us this is what it looks like to pursue the things of the world. Let me, let me help take you down a path. Of a, of a consumeristic life, unrepentant consumeristic life, a, a self-indulgent life. Here is a, a picture of where this leads. So hopefully this, this passage, this parable, will, will help to, to shock us, to, to wake us up again to eternal realities, to see the, the things of this world for what they are, and to, to help us have a, a mindset for e eternal things, eternal realities. So we're going to be, uh, you see on the screen, Luke uh, 16, this morning, Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. This is a, a parable, uh, a picture, a story of a, of a man who, who, who loses his soul, who trades his soul for the things of this world. This is what it looks like. Uh, the story of a, of a religious man. And if you, you turn to Luke 16, before the, the parable, I just want to give you a little context. Uh, starting in verse 13, Jesus has told another parable uh, about stewardship, about an unrighteous steward. But look what he says in verse 13. He says, uh, Luke 16, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So this is the, the thrust of the, the parable that he had just told. You can't serve God and money. You can't have a divided heart, divided affections. And in verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So they are, they are listening, they are scoffing as Jesus says a parable, as he is rebuking them, as he's saying, be faithful with a, an eternal mindset. And they, they scoff in their hearts. And it says they're lovers of money. <coughs> um, they are those that that are, that are so gripped, they're, they're covetous, covetous is the word, uh, just perpetually discontent, always wanting more and more and more and never satisfied. And Jesus now is going to rebuke them, but actually rebuke them with a, a story. He's going to warn them. Say, this is what it looks like if you go down this path. Let me, let me paint a, a picture for you. And just, uh, I was just thinking about just scripture in general, just the benefit of, of scripture, of Jesus teaching, the way that Jesus teaches. I mean, so many different ways that he teaches. Uh, here, teaching in parables, uh, a picture to, to show us an earthly truth. He's going to drive this point home. Back to verse 14, he's going to drive home the, 
the outcome of one who, who lives for this world, who lives for the pursuits of this world, who loves the things of this world, like the Pharisees, and really a, as a warning for us. So he's going to give us a, a picture. This is what a consumeristic life looks like. This is what it leads to, uh, a self-indulgent life, a life lived for pleasure. And this is recorded for, for our benefit as believers. So there is something here for us. This is not just a a rebuke against the Pharisees to say, okay, don't, don't be a Pharisee. No, this is a, uh, an encouragement, an exhortation, admonishment for us, for followers of Christ, for us to, to be warned, don't go down this path. Don't love the things of the world. To, to actually remind ourselves what is valuable, hopefully the, the thrust of this passage, to actually help us to, to value Christ over and above the things of this world. I think that's what, what this passage is here for, to help us not be self-indulgent, to not go after uh, earthly pursuits over and above Jesus Christ. And here it's a, a warning for us. So let's read together the parable and then we'll, we'll work through it uh, this morning. So Luke 16, starting in verse 19. This is the, the story here from Jesus. He says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. <clears throat> Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here, you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that they may warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Uh, every time we, we open our Bibles, uh, whether it's a, an intense passage like this, but every time we open God's word, I, I like to think of it like coming to a, a fork in the road a fork in the road moment where we have to decide again, uh, who are we going to serve? Are we going to follow what God says? Are we going to submit ourselves under, under the word of God? Are we going to choose to serve the Lord over and above whatever else might be competing in our hearts? And here Jesus uh, takes us to a, a fork in the road, to a, a decision. And you see here a man going down a path, going down, you could say, the wrong path, choosing uh, the things of this world, and, and here is the outcome for him. Here is a man who has traded eternal things for earthly things. And this is a, a warning for us to, to not go after things of this world, to not be self-indulgent like this man. So we're going to see in this passage really three, three views. This is a a story that Jesus gives, three, three pictures in this passage of what I'm calling a, an unrelenting consumer, uh, unrepentant consumer, someone who is self-indulgent. And what does this lead to? And the first, uh, the first picture here, the first view is the picture from the, the physical world. You could say the, the earthly perspective, what we can see with our eyes, the, the here and now. This is the, the setup for the parable. Verses 19 through 21. Uh, two men on display in this parable. You can see them there. The, the rich man and then Lazarus, a, a poor man. A great disparity between them. And the, the earthly view 
what you see is you see a, a successful man. You see a man who has all of the, the benefits, the physical benefits in this life, privilege and position and wealth and resources and friends and accomplishments. And you see, on the other hand, a, a poor man who has nothing, uh, a beggar. <clears throat> and it says in verse 19 that this rich man, it says, he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. These are the, the clothing of the, of the, you could say, of the indulgent. Uh, purple, to have purple clothes. This was a sign of wealth, to be able to dye their clothing. And the fine linen, this is a, an undergarment for comfort. So he has the extravagant clothing and the, and the comfortable clothing mixed together. You know, in our, in our culture, whatever would be the, the thing that would show that you have money. Maybe, maybe it's the watch, maybe it's the, the shoes, you know, the new Nikes or whatever it might be, the, the electric vehicle, you know, the, the signs of money. He has all of these things on the, on the outside. You can see that he has wealth. And what does he do with it? It says he joyously lives in splendor every day. He is living a, a vacation lifestyle. I think of the, the Instagram lifestyle. He's just, he's having fun all of the time. He's having parties. He's having friends over. This is the, the, the nice meals, whining and dining all the time. Uh, just uh, always having a party. And the poor man, on the other hand, a completely different life. I mean, again, this is the, the setup for the parable. There's going to be a, a contrast. We've already read it. You see what's coming. But here, the, the setup, you have the rich man who has all these resources and the poor man who is at his gate, covered with sores. I mean, the rich man's gate is big enough for this poor man to sit in and beg. You know, the, the gate, the entry point to his house is a place of commerce, is a place of activity because his, his estate is so big. And the poor man is just laying there. And it says that dogs are licking his sores. He just wants the, the crumbs. He wants whatever, whatever will come off the rich man's table, the, the trash from the rich man's house, because he has nothing. He has no ability to work. He is laying there. It seems like he is, uh, he is lame, unable to work unable to provide for himself, no, no resources, no house, no food, uh, just a, a hard life, nothing to show for himself in this life. And you couldn't have a, a picture of two more different people. You know, as, as Jesus sets the stage for this, this story, the, the difference on display between the poor man and the, and the rich man, and it says that even dogs are, are licking his wounds you think about not just like a cute puppy or a house pet, but these are wild dogs. I think of it more like coyotes, you know, ravenous dogs that are, that are trying to eat this man. And in the, in the culture in Israel, the dogs were unclean animals. So you have not only the, the this man is destitute, he's also unclean. You know, the, the rich man would, would have to walk by this unclean man every day. It would be an offense to him to have this man sitting at his gate and as, as you see this, this story unfold, what you see from an earthly perspective, on one hand, yes, you see a man with success and a man with wealth, but, but you also see the, the self-indulgent lifestyle on display where it, it seems like he's ignoring Lazarus. You know, what's on display is he is, not, he is not loving his neighbor. You know, there is laws in Israel about caring for the destitute and the poor. And he, this man is not being cared for. He is not being helped He's having to, to beg for the, the trash out of, this man's, out of this man's table, the leftovers. Uh, yes, the man is, is generous to his friends, having parties, joyously living, a uh, party lifestyle, but, but ignoring, not merciful to, to a man like Lazarus. And here for the, the audience, again, going after the, those that pursue the things of this world, the self-indulgent. Jesus here putting on display. This is what it, what it looks like from an earthly perspective. All of these good things. And, and in this culture, the, the disciples even of Jesus might, might mistake that the rich man is somehow uh, finding divine favor. Somehow he's blessed by God. He has found favor from God because he has all of these riches and this wealth. And they might even, and, and we might even, see someone in that position and be tempted to think, oh, that, that sounds pretty good. I want some of those things. I want that kind of lifestyle. There might be a, a temptation to say, yes, that, that sounds pretty good. What I have isn't enough. 
And here Jesus sets this up so that he can, he can shock us, so that he can shake us awake, so that he can say, don't go after that path, that he can actually show us the, the danger here of living for the things of this world. And you're going to see the, the contrast coming as the, the scene switch. The, the first scene, like I said, the, the view from the, the physical world, what you can see with your eyes. But now we get in the next scene, starting in verse 22, you get a, a heavenly perspective on this man. How does heaven view these things? What's a, an eternal perspective on the, the resources, really on the, the heart of these two men? In the world's eyes, the one man has success and fame and accomplishment and riches. The other man has nothing. But we see pretty quickly in verse 22, heaven's assessment of these two men. The, the last view from earth of the rich man is, is at his burial. There is a, a burial. There's a ceremony for him. There are people there. There's a, a party for him at his death. The poor man, no, no burials mentioned. But, but look at who is concerned about the poor man's death. It says that angels, in verse 22, carried away Lazarus. And the rich man also died and was buried. So you have a earth's assessment of the, the rich man. There's a burial. There's a party. There are people there. But then you have heaven's assessment. Who, who does heaven take notice of? Well, God sends his angels to get Lazarus. Heaven has actually taken notice of the, the poor man, of the destitute man. In God's eyes, the, the rich man does not have his approval. He has not found favor with God. Uh, earlier uh, last year, I uh, took a trip to Israel with a couple men from this church, uh, kind of a study trip. And one of the, the really interesting sights that we saw on this trip was the, the tombs of the, the Pharisees. There was a, basically in this uh, side of this hill underground were these, these tombs of the, the whole class of, of religious leaders in the time of Jesus, or maybe a couple, a couple hundred years after Jesus. And it was really fascinating in these tombs as you have the, I mean, they'd been all, grave robbers had taken all the treasures out in the last 2,000 years, but, but all of the, the tombs were just ornate. There was carvings in the tombs. They had buried themselves with with riches and jewelry and all these treasures. And it's just really fascinating to think about these, these Israelites who were burying themselves with all these riches because in their mind they were thinking about when we wake up after our death, we're going to wake up in, in God's kingdom and we're going to be rulers in this kingdom because we're the religious elite. And we're going to bury ourselves with all our stuff so that we can have it when we, when we come back and, and we get to rule in this kingdom. And these are the, the same people that that were part of the group that crucified the Messiah, that rejected Christ. And just think about that, that picture and this man, this rich man, being buried with all of his stuff, thinking that he's going to wake up in God's kingdom, thinking that he's found favor with God. And he finds that he wakes up, it says in verse 23, in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. In Hades, this holding place for the unrighteous dead. He is in torment. He, he has not found himself waking up in God's kingdom, but he is actually uh, opposed to God. He is not right with the living God. And there is a, a reversal here. You, you see that Jesus has set up in uh, earthly perspective. You see the, the two men, the rich man and the poor man, and now in death. Uh, heaven's perspective of these two men, completely different. That the, the poor man wakes up and finds himself at, at Abraham's side, in the bosom of Abraham, it, it might say in your translation, this is a, a place of a privileged position. You think about at a banquet table. He's sitting next to Abraham. He's in a seat of honor at the side of Abraham. Uh, Abraham, who is the, the, the father, you could say, of the Israelite faith. The one who in Genesis 15 says that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And this, is, uh, the, this man, Lazarus, is a child of Abraham by faith. But the rich man, also a child of Abraham, look, he says, Father Abraham. He is calling out to Abraham in verse 24 as his father, a, a descendant of Abraham. Both of these men, descendants of Abraham. One of them, uh, a spiritual descendant by faith. The other one, only a physical descendant, finds himself actually at odds with God in judgment. 
all of the, the riches that he had, all of the, the pleasures that he had, all the money that he had did not help him in the day of judgment. After this life, th- those things were not there for him. And think about the, the shock for this man, not only to, to be in torment, but to look, it says, to look and see Lazarus. He said he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus and he cries out to them. So he sees this poor beggar now in paradise and he finds himself in Hades, in judgment. And he's further indicted in verse 24 by the fact that, that he knows Lazarus. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He knows this man's name, the man who sat at his gate. He knew him. He ignored him his whole life. And here is the, the reality for this, this rich man, that he is a religious man. That's important for us to, to realize. This is a religious man. We find out that he has the, the Old Testament scriptures. He is an Israelite. He is clinging to his, his seat at the table because he, he comes from the line of Abraham, because he has wealth and resources. So he's actually been clinging to all of these things. And in judgment, those things mean nothing to God. And the poor man, he had a really a, a horrible life. Nothing good went, for, nothing went well for him. No earthly success, no possessions, no significance. But here, in eternity, reward. And not that there's something more noble about being poor, but, but we know where, where saving faith comes from. We know that God saves those who turn away from themselves. God saves the, the spiritually destitute, the spiritually bankrupt, those who look away from their own self-righteousness. So that is this man, as opposed to the rich man who is trusting in himself. In verse 25, Abraham responds to the rich man. He says, child, remember that during your life, you received your good things, And likewise, Lazarus, bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And and get the picture here. This word, I think, is helpful. Even the word comfort. A man who who went after comfort in this life, who chose a comfortable life, an indulgent life, finds agony in the life to come. And the man who who only received, Lazarus, who only received bad things in this life, in the life to come, reward, blessing, and inheritance. The, here, the contrast couldn't be greater between these two men. In life, the contrast between rich and poor, and now in death, the contrast between being, being right with a holy God and being in judgment. And here, Abraham is telling him in verse 26, uh, sorry, in verse 25, that he received his good things. Basically, he's telling him that your, your actions have consequences. You chose this life. You chose what you valued in life. You chose to go after earthly pursuits. And there are consequences for those actions. You are now reaping what you have sown. And this principle is so helpful for us. As you think about resources, you think about how you spend your, your time and your money and your lives, just to, to think about this principle that you reap what you sow that your actions in this life have consequences. That is what Abraham is saying to him. Your actions have consequences, that you sowed a life of selfish pursuits, and now you are reaping the consequences. This isn't uh, unfair. This isn't unjust. This isn't something happening to him that he should have been surprised about. In life, he was, was full, full of of resources, full of other men's opinions, full of glory for himself. And now he is completely alone. And I think it's interesting, this parable, that his name is not even mentioned. You have the the poor man's name, Lazarus, mentioned, the rich man, no name, not even remembered. Nothing nothing important about him to remember into eternity. He is suffering by himself alone, begging for just a, a drop of water. And worse than all of that, Obviously, the, the suffering, the, the shock, the horror of it, to find out in verse 26, as Abraham says, that there is a, a chasm fixed, a, a chasm, an uncrossable chasm. That is to say that you can never leave this place. This is a final. This judgment is final, and it is forever. It is unending. 
all the, the resources that he had will, will not be able to get him out of here. And he wants to, to have this beggar. Well, have Lazarus help me. Still sees himself in a, in a position of, of strength and power. <laughs> have Lazarus help me. And he finds himself to be completely alone, no resources. Uh, on earth, you think about just the chasm between these two men, the, the poor man and the rich man. There was a, a chasm on earth. There was a disparity. You know, the poor man in this, this miserable condition, the rich man. You think about in, in like Indian culture, uh, you hear about a, a caste system. I was reading a biography, a William Carey biography. It talks about the, the caste system in India, that the, the poor, the lowest class, just have a near impossible time progressing into a different class, that they can't get out of their poverty. You think about that, that's a, there's a chasm there between poor and rich, but not, not an uncrossable chasm. You could imagine a, a situation where someone could get out of poverty, where someone could have a, an event, at least one person could, could find resources, could find treasure in our day and age, could, could start a business, could get themselves out of poverty. So there, there was a, a chasm, there was a disparity, but not uncrossable. But now the, the chasm between this man and the rich man and the poor man in eternity is uncrossable. There is a chasm they cannot cross, that, that now their, their fates are sealed. Here, Jesus telling us through this parable that, etern- that, that eternity is final. It is forever. There is a heaven and hell after this life. And again, back to the, the context of thinking about the, the self-indulgent man, those that want to live for the things of this world, to remind us again that this life is temporary and there is a, a forever future after this life. Everyone in this room will live forever. All of you in this room have eternal souls. Every, every kid in our house will live forever, either living in the presence of God for eternity or, or we see here separated from God in, in agony, in judgment, in hell. This is a reality that we must come back to again and again. As you think about just how we live our lives, how we spend our time, how we spend our resources to come back to this reality, that this life is short, that eternity is coming, that it's final, that it's forever. And to remind ourselves again that we will all die someday. We will all stand before Christ that you will live forever. And we, we must stop again as we come to this passage. We open our Bibles just to remind ourselves there is a God in heaven. He is just, and he is a good judge. And he offers pardon, and he offers forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And he offers eternal life to those who have faith. But, but he is also a just judge that will punish those who, who choose their own way the self-indulgent man who chooses himself, who loves himself, who serves himself, will find himself at odds with Jesus Christ into eternity. This is a a vivid picture for us of hell, of of punishment, of suffering. I want to read a a quote, a little bit of an extended quote from Jonathan Edwards that I think just captures the the eternality of hell, the, the chasm that can't be crossed that you see in this passage. Listen to Jonathan Edwards. He says, Do but consider how dreadful despair will be in such torment. How dismal will it be when you are under these racking torments to know assuredly that you never, never shall be delivered from them, to have no hope. When you shall wish that you might be turned into nothing, but you shall have no hope of it. When you would rejoice if you might have any relief after you have endured those torments for millions of ages, but you shall have no hope of it. When after you shall have worn out the age of the sun and moon and stars, in your groans and lamentations, without any rest day or night, without one minute's ease, yet you shall have no hope of ever being delivered. When after you shall have worn out a thousand more such ages, yet you shall have no hope, but shall know that you are not one bit near to the end of your torments, There are the same groans, the same shrieks, the same cries incessantly to be made by you that the smoke of your torment shall still ascend up forever and ever 
and your souls, which shall have been agitated with the wrath of God all this while, will still exist to bear more wrath. He goes on to say, How dreadful will eternity appear to them after they shall have been thinking on it for ages and shall have had so long an experience over their torments. The damned in hell will have two infinites perpetually to amaze them and swallow them up. One is an infinite God whose wrath they will bear and whom they will behold as their irreconcilable enemy. The other is the infinite duration of their torment. This is the, the chasm that cannot be crossed, the, the torment forever and ever. And this is where the path leads for the, the self-indulgent, the one who lives for the things of this world, who chooses this world over Christ, who treasures the things of this world over Christ. So we, we must look at a passage like this again and live with this in view as, as you think about just on a Monday morning. How do I spend my time? How do I spend my resources? How do I, how do I, how do I parent my children? How, how do I work hard at work? I mean, all of the things that we have in front of us with this in view that there is eternity coming. Because we see where, where a self-indulgent lifestyle leads, where the, the, life, the life of this rich man leads. And for the, the believer in Jesus Christ, we know that this is not our destiny, that we have hope. There is still good news in this passage. As, as you read this passage and you see the, the, the rich man, obviously, is being highlighted, his destiny being highlighted. But you also have the, the poor man. You have Lazarus, who is in paradise, the one who had nothing in this life, the one who was destitute, finds himself in paradise forever. Not because of anything he did. He brought nothing to the table. He had no resources in his own. He had nothing to offer God. And he finds himself in heaven. And not because of anything he did. You know this as believers in Christ, because of what Christ did. That we have a mediator. We have a great high priest. We have hope for eternity. So there is uh, good news here, but, but we must not skip past the, the warning for us, the, the shock, the, really the, the horror of hell that you see in this passage. And as the, the passage continues, we see a, a final scene that unfolds for us. The, the first scene is we, we saw a view of this man in life, an earthly perspective of this man. A second was a, a heavenly perspective, an eternal view. And then lastly, the, the last perspective, the last view is actually a, a window, a view into this man's heart. We actually get to see what drove this man. What did he love? Out of the, the overflow of the, the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. So we see what's going on in this, this man's heart by what he says, how he responds we're going to see what, what drove this man. What did he desire? You could say, what was his authority in this life? What was he pursuing? And this is uh, so helpful for us to, to see what's on display as this man speaks, as he responds to Abraham, as we see his heart unfold before us. Because it gives us a picture, a warning to say, okay, let, let not my heart do that. Let me not say that in my heart. Let me protect myself from that kind of thinking and those kind of desires. Uh, I had someone, uh, I was, had an opportunity to, to speak at a, a memorial service. Someone called into the church, asked me to speak at a memorial for someone that wasn't part of the church, uh, as far as I know, not a believer. And some of the advice I got was, you know, what do you say in this environment? How do you, how do you open up and, and give truth in a compassionate way? And, uh, and one of the things I heard that, that a couple of people have said in different, different contexts is that, you know, at a, whether it's a believer or unbeliever, what you could say is, you know, this person, if they were still here, this is what they'd want you to know. If they were here today, what they would want you to know and tell them about Christ and tell them about eternity, that there is a heaven and hell. And I think that's a, a pretty compelling thought. And here we don't have to, to speculate even. We actually get the words of a man in hell. As you look at the end of Luke 16, here is the, the response. Here is the, the words. What a man in hell would say, what he would warn us with. And in this, we see his heart on display. 
But look, he says, verse 27, I beg you, Father, send him, that's Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so they will not come to this place of torment. This man, all of a sudden, he sees, on one hand, you could say he sees the error of his ways. He knows that hell is real. He wants to warn his family, do not come here. You know, you're looking for repentance. Is he going to repent? Is he going to agree with Abraham? Is he going to see? And we know that there are no repenters in hell. The Holy Spirit brings the dead to life, causes repentance. The Holy Spirit is not at work in hell. This man is not repenting. But he knows that hell is real. He, he knows that judgment is fixed and final. And he wants to warn his family. No acknowledgement of his own guilt. But he, he knows hell is real. He wants to warn them. And look what he says in, as he goes on in verse, what well, Abraham responds in verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So he's saying, your, your family, this religious family, we find out really, really religious because because he's saying they, they have the, the scriptures. Moses and the prophets, that's shorthand for the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, sometimes Moses, the writings and the prophets, sometimes just Moses and the prophets, basically the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. He's saying they have the scriptures. They have their Old Testament, God's revelation up to this point. They have it. They know God's word. They have been warned. This is what Abraham is saying to him in the parable. They have already been urged. Think about what, what did Moses and the prophets do? They, they warned. They gave promises. They gave hope. They gave exhortations. The prophets come and they, they warn the people to repent. They say that judgment is coming. So they have the word of God. Listen to Isaiah, end of Isaiah 66. If you know this passage, end of Isaiah 66 gives us uh, from scripture a picture of hell, a picture of this chasm you have at the end of Isaiah 66, it says, all mankind will come down to bow before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. You have there a picture of eternal destruction. This is throughout the Old Testament scripture. There is a warning. A warning. There is judgment coming for those who will not repent. And remember back to what, what Moses himself says about Abraham. You have Abraham here. How does Abraham get to heaven? How does anyone get to heaven? Well, Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is how any, any sinner gets to heaven. Not because of something they have done. Because they need a, an alien righteousness. They need a righteousness that's not their own. A righteousness that comes only through faith. This is revealed in the scriptures, the early pages of Genesis. So here Abraham is saying to this man, they have God's word. They have been warned. But look at, this is where the, the heart of this man is on display. Look at verse 30. His heart is on display and how he responds and really how he views the word of God. He says, no, Father Abraham, no, the, the scriptures are not enough. This is what he's saying. The scriptures are not compelling enough. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He's saying, here's what they really need. Let me tell you, Abraham, let me tell you, God, what would be more compelling, what would be more helpful. Let me put myself in the, the seat of authority here. If you've ever been in evangelistic conversations, you may have, may have heard this type of uh, argument where someone, you're, you're telling them about the gospel, and they're saying, well, I want to I see it with my eyes. If God would just speak to me, if he would just give me a sign, if he would just tell me, then I would believe. If he would do something miraculous, then I would believe. And, and they put themselves in the seat of authority, and they say, I, I will tell God what he can do to save me. I'll tell him what's more compelling than his word. And that's what this man is doing. He's putting himself in the seat of authority, even in death, in hell, in torment. He still sees himself as an authority. And Abraham says, no, not, not if they see a, a man rise from the dead. Uh, foreshadowing here. You think about the, another man named Lazarus. 
You remember in John, the book of John, when, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. What, what do they do? What do the Pharisees do with Lazarus? It says that some believed and that they tried to kill Lazarus. They tried to hide the evidence. And what do they do with Messiah rises from the dead? Is the issue that they, they didn't see the miracles of Jesus. That they didn't see him walk on water and, and raise the dead and heal the sick. Is that the issue? No, the issue is they, they had hardened hearts. Back to the, the issue here in the passage, specifically what Jesus is going after, verse 13. That they, they loved, verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. That they loved the things of this world. It's not a coincidence that the, the self-indulgent, those who love the things of this world at the same time, reject God's word. Those things go hand in hand. You, you love this world. You love earthly things. And when God speaks, you don't listen. You don't repent. You don't, you don't believe what he says. The, the hardened heart there and the love for this world goes hand in hand because God's word reveals God. It reveals his character. And we come to the word of God as believers to know God, to fellowship with God. To, to learn about our Savior. This, is, this book is God's will, God's revealed will, who God is, what he loves, what he desires. So we come to this book to know God. And you could say, if, if you're asking the question, well, how do I know whether I'm pursuing the, the things of this world? How do I know if I'm self-indulgent like this man? How do I know if I'm going after the things of this world? Well, here in this passage, the, the simple answer you can know what, what you love in life by how you treat the Word of God. What do you do when God speaks in this book? When you hear God's Word, when you read it, do you believe what God says? Do you obey His commands? Do you submit yourselves under this authority? That is the, the issue. What's, what's evidence for this man? What, what's on display as you see him respond to Abraham to say, no, Moses and the prophets are not enough. As he responds, he reveals what's going on in his heart. He reveals what he loves. He reveals what he submits to. You could say he reveals what led him down this path. He doesn't believe God's word. And this is so instructive for us to evaluate our own lives. Really as a, as a, as a hope for us, as an encouragement. You know, what, what prevents me from going down this path? How do I not end up like this? Will you submit yourself under the word of God? You, you come to this book as one who loves God, who wants to know God, and you submit yourself and your life under it. This is the, the evidence. If you go back to just a couple of verses, in, in verse, uh, verse 18 of Luke 16, you have this uh, right before the parable, this interesting statement where he says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. And in the context, you might be wondering, why, why does Jesus throw this statement in here? Why is all of a sudden he talking about divorce and, and marriage? Well, I think he's actually demonstrating, just like he does in the parable, he's demonstrating that those who love the things of this world, they have, they have made excuses for obeying the, the clear commands of God. You know, they love comfort and ease and pleasure. And all of a sudden, marriage, God's command and instruction for marriage, is not that easy. Any of you that have been married for a while, it's not, every day is not easy. You have to work at it. For the one who is so consumed with a love for self, and they find all of a sudden their spouse is not pleasing them, this is what the Pharisees were doing, is they were going to find a new spouse. I'm going to find someone else that can please me, someone else that can make me more happy. If my goal is my own happiness, I'm going to find someone that can help me do that. And here, verse 18, here's a, an example that Jesus gives. This is what you're doing with marriage. This is what you do when God speaks. Here is a, an evidence. And we see the same thing in, in this man's response. When he says, no, Father Abraham, show me a sign. He is not compelled by the word of God. He's not submitting himself under it. And this man did all of the external things. He, he might have done everything externally. A follower of, of the law, went to the, the feasts and the festivals, kept the Sabbath. A religious man heard the, God's word every week at the synagogue. He tithed and offerings, all of those religious acts. 
But on the throne of this man's heart was himself. It wasn't, it wasn't the Lord. He didn't love God. And because he didn't love God, his word wasn't compelling to him. What was more compelling was his own experience and his own feelings. And this is the, the issue, this self-indulgent lifestyle manifested in the way that he views the scripture. And this, this man, like many of us, was extremely privileged. And, you know, our society throws the word privilege around, and maybe that's a dangerous word to use. And I, and I say the word privilege, I told my kids this the other day, that you are some of the most privileged people on earth. And what I mean by that is not because you live in the United States. It's not because you have electricity. It's not because there's Costco and, and Amazon Prime or any of those things. What I mean is you are privileged because you have God's word in your language, that every week you get to sit in here and hear God's word, that you have in, in your lap an English Bible, that we are a, a privileged generation because we have the word of God, because God has spoken, because we know his word, because he's revealed himself to us. And the same for this man. He had the word of God. Uh, listen to, to Jim Elliot. He tells this, uh, this story of, of why he left for the, the mission field. Someone asked him, there, there are plenty of, of Americans who need to, to hear God's word. Why would you go somewhere else? And he says, you wonder why people choose fields far away from the States when young people at home are drifting because no one wants to take time to listen to their problems. He says, I, I'll tell you why I left. Because those stateside young people have every opportunity to study, hear, and understand the word of God in their own language. And these Indians, the, the place where he went to be a missionary, these Indians have no opportunity whatsoever. I have had to make a cross of two logs and lie down on it to show the Indians what it means to crucify a man. When there is that much ignorance over here and so much knowledge and opportunity over there, I have no question in my mind why God sent me. He goes on to say, those whimpering stateside young people will wake up on the day of judgment condemned to worse fates than these demon-fearing Indians because having a Bible, they were bored with it, while these have never heard of such a thing as writing. And that, that quote, I think, just captures that so well, the, the one who has God's word and who is bored with it who's looking for, for earthly pleasures, looking for other pursuits, other things to, to make them happy, something else. The, the heart here of the, the consumer on display. I want, I want something more exciting than the word of God. I want something that, that fulfills me, that makes me happier than this old book. That is what is on display in this man's heart. And that's what is so helpful. This passage is so helpful to, to shock us awake again. To, to look at the, all of the, the resources that we have, all of the time that we have, everything in front of us, the, the opportunities the Lord has given, and to look at them from a, an eternal perspective again. And this is what Jesus does. He, he, he shows us in a, in a weight, in the scales of eternity, what is most important. This is what it looks like. This is what a, a life looks like that goes after pursuits in this world, that treasures this world over Christ. And my, my prayer is that, that you, that we, as we read a passage like this, would, would come again afresh to the, the reality that, that Jesus, like a, a treasure in the field, Jesus says, the one who finds the, the gospel, who finds Christ, is like a man who finds a treasure in a field and sells everything that he has for that treasure. He would say, Jesus Christ is worth more than, than anything that I possess. That he is, he is my treasure. Nothing in this world can satisfy this is what Jesus does. He puts the, the weight on a scale. Here is the things of this world, and here is eternity. Here is your soul. And at the same time, he, he gives us a, a path, you could say, a, a means. How do we fight this battle in our hearts? Well, well he has given us his word, the, the very word of God. He has revealed his character to us. You know, how do we, we battle a consumeristic, a self-indulgent mindset? We come back again to this book. We read passages like this and we remind ourselves what is true. What is God's assessment of all of these things? This is what we need to do again and again and again. 
to renew our minds. This is uh, ultimately the, the issue, you could say, is a, a theology proper issue. Say theology proper, the, the study of God. Uh, what you do with God's word, and what you do with anything, what you do with the resources, it, it reflects how you view God. It reflects whether or not you, you prioritize, whether you prize the Lord. So let me, uh, let me pray as we close and just pray that we would be a, a people who, who do prize Jesus Christ, who are warned in the right way and encouraged to prize, to treasure Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, I just thank you for a passage like this, uh, an indicting passage, uh, a scary passage, Lord. And I pray that we would be weighed down in the right ways, but that we would find uh, encouragement that we are not those who, who shrink back in fear, but are those who persevere, Lord, to the salvation of our souls, so that we are those who have been saved and redeemed and purchased, Jesus, by your blood, so that we would see the, the frailty, the shortness, the brevity of life, the reality of eternity, finality of judgment, and that would spur us on today, this week, Jesus, to live for you, to prize you above all things. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.